2020 has been a pretty great year for games with heavy hitters like Ghost of Tsushima, The Last of Us Part II, and Animal Crossing New Horizons being among the biggest releases. However, one indie darling has held its own against the AAA giants this award season, the hack and slash roguelike Hades. That was for last time. What's up, Pro Guides fam? I'm Tia Johns from Venn, and today we're going to dive into just how Hades became so popular and what its success means for the future of games. Oh, and don't worry, this video is spoiler free if you hadn't gotten around to playing it just quite yet. Hades was developed and published by Supergiant Games, a studio founded in 2009 in San Francisco by former EA developers Amir Rao and Gavin Simon. The two had met at work and one day decided to quit their full-time jobs, move in together, and start making their own games. Supergiant has grown substantially over the years and has made a total of four games to date, including Bastion, Transistor, Pyre, and of course, Hades, all of which have been met with near universal acclaim too. It's difficult enough to make a good game at all, but Supergiant seemed to know what they were doing from the get-go. You gotta hand it to the Calamity. It did the job quick. Bastion went on to place on many best games of the year lists following its release in 2011 and went down as one of the best indie games of the past decade. Supergiant's wasn't exactly one of those starving artist stories as we hear about with other studios that are just starting up. They seem to know their strengths as well, as each of their games has stayed within the action RPG genre in one way or another. When Hades was opened up to the public in early access in 2018, Supergiant was looking to improve on the formula that they had perfected over the years, as well as to explore some new design ideas, mechanics, and themes they hadn't yet had a chance to touch on. Hades is the next big thing from Supergiant Studios. I say next big thing because from what I've played so far, I'm very confident that when this game finally emerges from early access, it will be fantastic. With the release of Pyre in 2017, Supergiant wanted to explore non-linear storytelling, specifically procedurally generated narrative. However, the issue there was that most players weren't interested in playing through the game multiple times to see the full effects of the non-linear story, which was needed to really understand how things change from playthrough to playthrough. Our fourth game uh, is called Hades. It's a narrative-driven roguelike dungeon crawler in which you battle your way out of the underworld of Greek myth. Hades was the perfect opportunity to make the procedurally generated story not only a feature, but the focus. The conceit this time around was that it would be a roguelike game, rather than players needing to go through the entire story multiple times to notice the effects of the procedural generation, they would simply have to die. And come back to life. So with this idea in mind, Supergiant decided to go for a roguelike this time around. Now, for those who may not know, a roguelike is a subgenre of games that traditionally features a dungeon crawl through procedurally generated levels, and the player only has one life. A 1980 classic with the unsurprising name Rogue originated the genre, paving the way for games that would replicate, iterate, and improve upon its mechanics. The game that is now considered to be one of the best versions of a roguelike of all time, Hades, was fully released on September 17th, 2020, and quickly took the world by storm. It may have been out in early access for a few years, but the word of mouth marketing that followed the official release is what really helped propel the game into the spotlight. In Hades, players take on the role of Zagreus, the god of the dead's fictional son who is created specifically for the game. The goal is to escape the underworld with the help of your various godly and sometimes moody aunts, uncles, and cousins. Players battle their way to the surface through the various sections of the underworld, each of which have their own dangers, and power up Zagreus through various means along the way. Simply put, the gameplay is well designed in every way. The moment-to-moment -moment battles with enemies are fast-paced and exciting, and challenge you in a way that makes you want to get better, so you can come back and beat it the next time when you die. All the various currencies, resources, and powers players will encounter throughout their runs have a specific purpose and feel satisfying to attain, in a way that the grind never feels like one. In short, it's just fun. Oh god! Oh god! Oh god! Stop! Stop! Oh god! 
Oh my god! One of the things about Hades gameplay that makes it so unique as a roguelike is that dying is actually part of the main gameplay loop. In short, players will go out on a run, collect various resources and currencies, die, and return to the hub world. Then, back at the hub, players can use those resources to become stronger, which means they will get further on the next run. In this way, the often challenging gameplay feels productive and rewarding to the point that you'll sometimes find yourself looking forward to when you die, so you purchase that new item or power-up that will help you along the next time. Hell yeah! <laughs> When it came to the story, Supergiant fixed their eyes on the top of Mount Olympus, deciding to make the Greek pantheon the backdrop for their new game. Greek mythology has never really gone out of style since, well, since it originated. The convoluted drama and colorful characters made for the perfect starting point for a cast that the player would get to know and love. The character designs are endlessly imaginative as well, with characters that are recognizable while also giving us fresh new takes on them. Another aspect of what made the cast stand out was the spectacular work the voice actors did, as the game is entirely voiced. Halt, Sagrius. Not one step further. With such a large voice cast, each character feels distinct and memorable, and there's not a single voice that feels weaker than the others or out of place. What's even more impressive is that almost the entirety of the cast is doubled up on roles, but Hades actor Logan Cunningham tops them all, having voiced a total of six different main characters in the game. Stupid boy. I told you nobody gets out of here, whether alive or dead. Of course, there's also the fact that you never seem to get any repeating dialogue, even dozens of hours in. How exactly is this achieved? Well, it's really more simple than you might think. It's just an obscene amount of dialogue that was written and recorded 300,000 words to be exact. For context, that's more words than the entirety of the Odyssey and the Iliad combined. And it's that kind of dedication that makes this game what it is. Additionally, the Greek gods made it a lot easier to tie the narrative into the core gameplay mechanics with each of their domains corresponding to a power-up that is themed after them. For example, Zeus is the god of thunder, so he gives you lightning powers. Poseidon is the god of the sea, so his powers have to do with the ocean, and so on. If all of that wasn't good enough, Hades also offers a ridiculous amount of content for its price tag. The end game isn't just tacked on either. It feeds into the rest of the story and mechanics perfectly, and makes players excited to challenge themselves past what they may have thought they were even capable of. Without getting into spoiler territory, you will be pleasantly surprised by new content even dozens of hours after the end credits have rolled, giving us some of the the best bang for our buck we've seen from a game in a long time. A game this stuffed with content should be, well, it should feel overstuffed. It should feel overwhelming, like there's far too much. It should feel like there are weak links in the in the armor here. Like, like not all of these systems, not all of these little accoutrements, not all of them should be this high quality, but all of them are. They are of an equally high quality. Some people may not even want to stick around for the gameplay alone, but instead want to tie up any loose ends with the story that they may have missed. The fact that it's so hard to say goodbye is a testament to how well the devs endeared us to the entire cast of characters, on top of keeping the combat interesting for hundreds of hours. Another thing that makes Hades really stand out among the crowd is how it mixes genres. Yes, it is foremost a hack and slash roguelike, but it also includes the mechanics from RPGs, community and dating simulators, and even home decoration features like you might see in The Sims or Animal Crossing. Somehow, all of these seemingly disparate pieces come together perfectly. That was for last time. It's something that sounds like a noisy, complicated mess on paper, but in the game, it really works. During the actual runs, you're just enjoying the punchiness of the combat, but in the hub, you're excited to learn more about your favorite characters or to purchase that new piece of furniture that will really tie the room together. Few tales are told of Hades, whose very name inspires fear and penitence reminding us of the inevitable fate which we all share. Rather than having to wade through filler to get to the moments you love, every second of this game is something to look forward to, which makes it one of the most addicting games of the year. So that begs the question, what exactly does Hades' success mean for the games industry, if anything? For one thing, other games could learn a thing or two about how tight every part of the gameplay is. Everything feeds back into itself, and nothing is superfluous or wasted. When it comes to the story, it achieves the main point it set out to prove, that 
procedurally generated storylines can and do work. As much as we all love linear cinematic narratives and games, Hades plays with non-linear interactive storytelling in ways that we haven't seen quite yet, especially at this level of quality. Hades' story delivers on exactly what makes interactive narratives feel like something only a game could achieve. It's incredibly responsive. All of the dialogue is procedurally generated, but also considers conditionals and prioritization, which is just fancy game dev terms for the fact that the game will keep up with what you're doing and give you dialogue that fits. I never grew accustomed to the air up here. It gusts senselessly whichever way it pleases. I suppose you must prefer it to the stillness of the air below. It's all a fairly simple system, but it's really how it's used that makes it all feel so good. A huge part of what makes the story so awesome is because there's no way it could have been told in any other medium than in a game. Time to go get killed again. Hades did plenty to raise the bar for gameplay design, art direction, voice acting, and interactive stories. But what will really leave a legacy for years to come is how perfectly all of those things come together to create one experience. Um, hello? When every aspect feels like it was developed with so much care and passion, it's hard to ignore. That's exactly how Hades ended up being nominated for Game of the Year categories across the industry, which is a huge deal, because that nomination usually only goes to AAA games. Indie games have been on the rise for the better part of a decade and have challenged conventions and tried interesting new things from the beginning. Having a game break out of the indie category to be considered one of the all-time greats wouldn't have been possible only a few years ago and shows that the industry is more willing to embrace those challenges to the status quo than ever. Fans have obviously enjoyed Hades likely more so than any other super giant game, and all we can do now is hope that the rest of the industry will learn from what they did right. Now, here's Zoo hoping for some DLC. So have you played Hades yet? If so, what did you like or dislike about it? Do you think it deserves Game of the Year? Let us know in the comments below. Once again, I'm Tia Johns, and I'll see you in the next one.